Hello lovely people. If you're new here then hi, I'm Jessica and this is my channel. I talk about the things that matter to me. Chronic illness, disability, parenting, history and LGBTQ plus topics in a kind of light-hearted sort of wow I would not be allowed to live in the past and I'm only held together by tape glue and some really expensive pharmaceuticals. Absolutely no one is going to harvest my DNA in dystopia sort of way. Today we're going to talk about item number 32 on the gay agenda. Spreading the word to the kids. Oh, did you not get the agenda? I really thought Belinda had sent those out. Gosh, drag queens are normally so organised. Yes, it's time for a review of just how effective we've been in infiltrating children's media. It's a genre that we as a family may soon get a lot of exposure to, but perhaps one that only one of us actually wants to watch. Me. It's me. Rupert's only 21 months old currently, so he is completely uninterested. Even when I try to explain that Elsa's actually a queer icon, he does enjoy dancing to Frozen songs though, and he was interested in playing with his friend's Elsa doll, so you know, we're gonna have to let him off. But regardless of how many online campaigns there are, and how many of us point out that, come on Disney, you're clearly queer coding Elsa, just let her say it probably isn't going to happen. Queer coding, by the way, is when a character is given traits or dialogue, I mean they read the viewer as being queer, without the character expressly being stated to be so, either within the show slash movie, or outside of it by the creators of the property. I know, it isn't always intentional. For more on queer coding, watch my video here. For more on queer baiting, which is intentional, and the ethics of such, watch this video by friend of the channel, the marvellous Rowan Ellis. But no, today we're going to be looking at LGBTQ plus representation in children's media, with characters that are both out, and those who may not be explicitly out, but those who nonetheless take strides towards non cis representation. Um, because if we just talked about the ones who were out, this video would be two minutes long, and it's not worth putting makeup on for that. But before we begin, is it too adult? <gasps> Boom, yes, let's start with the hard hitting questions. I jest, that question isn't hard hitting, it's boring. Mm. I, mm, I, I, just, I just can't be doing with this line of reasoning. No, there will always be some people who will claim that issues of sexuality and gender identity are too adult and have no place among content created for children. And that is born of the spectacularly misguided notion that exposure to these topics will some way oh, corrupt the young, impressionable, developing mind, turning a child queer, just like a vampire or werewolf bite will create more undead to swell their ranks. I mean, that is how vampires and werewolves work. Yes, okay, that's a good point. But my point still stands for the queers because 1. Studies and anecdotal evidence do show that people who identify as LGBTQ plus as adults also would have done so as children had they been given the correct terminology because, you know, they felt the same way. 2. There are many different people in the world. Many of these people are parents. Many of these people have children who would like to see their own family makeup depicted on screen. The five-year-old is not asking to see two women passionately making out because they already think that's, you know, it's sort of gross when their own parents smooch. They're asking that when they watch their favourite show about four young detectives, <gasps> at least one of them has same-sex parents like they do, because they don't see their family represented anywhere else. I didn't have any real exposure to gay people in pop culture when I was growing up. I had to pretend I was setting up the VHS player to film Time Team for my brother when really I wanted to record a soap opera afterwards that I didn't even normally watch or because I'd heard that this week's episode might have a mention of lesbians in and I needed the knowledge. <sighs> And of course, heartbreak, I came down the next morning, rewound the videotape and scrubbed all the way through it, only to find one of my freaking parents had stopped the recording right after Time Team finished. But don't worry, it made no difference at all. I'm still a lesbian. It's almost as if it's how we're wired rather than a choice or corruption. And the lack of representation in media only served to make that realisation way more complicated and difficult than it could have been. I would have been obsessed with Elsa at the age of four, even if I didn't really understand why her story was speaking to me so much. I still would have got this somehow related to my strong feelings for some girls. I mean, sure you can argue about Elsa, but we know. Now, According to a study by the independent Pew Research Center in America, the average age a child realizes that they may not be straight is 12 years old, and on average they are comfortable coming out by the time they're 16. That is a huge improvement from the 1980s, 
and the average age for coming out was 21. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with the amount of representation LGBTQ plus lives are now getting in young people's media. Also, I should have added a three in earlier. The children who come from cishet families are now going to grow up to live their own little cishet lives. It is incredibly important that they be introduced to the concept of diversity early on so that they know how to cope with it when they come across it. Trust me. My toddler goes to the playground with both of his mum and one wears visible hearing aids. I can tell which children have been taught about diversity and which haven't. I see you parents who think, oh god I thought I had more time, when their child asks how my toddler could possibly have two mums or tries to correct him when he calls one of us mummy and the other one mama or points at my ears and asks what those are or asks me why do we flap our hands around. I swear to god, I swear, if you think it is appropriate to send your child to school without any knowledge of disability so they can ask intrusive questions to the bold little souls who walk in on day one having had the confidence boosting pep talks with their hard working parents who spent all summer preparing them because they would be the only child there with a visible difference just so your poor child is accidentally put their foot in it because you couldn't be asked to sit them down with a book about how we are all different. Yes, children say uncomfortable things but it is obvious when it comes from a place of just I have been completely sheltered from this part of society and the question is why? Studies show the earlier you expose children to diverse skin types, body types, family makeups and religious or cultural markers the more accepting they will be. This is a first thought second thought thing by the way the idea that we are responsible not for our first thought but for our second thought. So your first thought is the unconscious response that is born of how you were raised and can include like a large element of bias. E.g. if you come from a family that holds views very different from your own, you can sometimes when confronted by something startling have a very different immediate first thought and then secondary thoughts. We see this a lot with things like internalised homophobia where the gut reaction may be that you are wrong to feel a certain way or do a certain thing even if you unconsciously know that is irrational. But back to giving all children exposure to the whole range of possible family makeups. These days there are so many options available for starting a family which incidentally I've recently made a video about which you can find up here or in the description. And with so many options of starting a family as an LGBTQ plus person or couple there are really no constraints on what a family could look like. And by representing those kinds of family dynamics within children's media you're cultivating a much more inclusive and accepting understanding little person's mind. So Far from corrupting today's youth, I think LGBTQ plus representation in children's media is actually helping to create a better, more equal and more compassionate generation. But that doesn't mean it's been an easy ride to get to this point. All that representation still isn't without its contrast. To show you why, I'll take you through a few specific examples. And to be clear, I'm talking primarily about TV, movies and kind of books that are created specifically for children in that they are canonically written that way, scheduled for before or after school times or are explicitly flagged as being for a younger audience. That's not to say these kinds of media aren't often enjoyed by adults, well, since the colourful and fantastical themes often appeal to our cravings for escapism in a dark and pressing world. As a result, they will often feature more mature themes and jokes that only adults will notice and enjoy. But the inclusion of queer characters isn't typically one of those themes, rather the representation we see is earnest and intentional. There are other family friendly shows that kids might end up watching depending on their age and preference, which also feature LGBTQ plus representation. Shows like Modern Family, Sex Education, The Symptoms and Nickelodeon's Loud House all have gay, queer or questioning characters within them. And there are gay characters in blockbuster family movies. There's a lesbian kiss between characters in the 2019 Star Wars film Rise of Skywalker, very quickly. The solo foppish McGregor played by Jack Whitehall in the 2021 film Jungle Cruise. And Fastos, Fast, Fast, you know what, I am deaf and it is okay that I mispronounce things. In the 2021 Marvel film Eternals, who is actually the best of that bunch because he has a husband and a son and he's happy. But in the interest of not making this video ridiculously long, I'm trying to focus primarily on the media that is aimed at smaller children as their main audience. First, the most obvious representation with characters that are most definitely out. That is characters that have been written as such in the script or the story or that the creators have confirmed that they identify as queer in some way. I am also not saying that I caught all of them. Please do leave the ones I have missed in the comments. Um, there are probably a lot. 
Yeah, I mean, also, I, I read subtitles, I don't listen to things, I struggle to pronounce words, I didn't hear before the age of 15, so if I mispronounce a name, I mean, I, I apologise. Let's just all be thankful I was a voracious reader with a large vocabulary by that point and that the internet tells me how to rhyme things. And while we're on the please excuse things Jessica does train, um, I, I got my jaw Botoxed again uh, two days ago, so my jaw might get tired soon. <laughs> It already hurts. But my face should soon even out again, which is nice. And then my jaw won't dislocate when I eat, so. TV. In modern TV and streaming shows, there's a few to pick from, although it's more common to see female gay relationships than male ones. Take Princess Bubblegum in the Cartoon Network series Adventure Time. The hugely successful show ran through 10 seasons between 2010 and 2018, following the adventures of a human, Finn, and his shape-shifting dog, Jake, in the land of Ooh. Princess Bubblegum is the scientifically minded ruler of the Candy Kingdom, who Jake and Finn encounter early on, and who plays a big role in many of the pair's adventures. She is, as is not at all surprising for the Candy Kingdom, in the land of Ooh, a humanoid made out of candy, but she's also fairly free with her affections and relationships. In the very first episode of the first series, when reanimating Mr. Cream Puff from the dead, as you do, she mentions how they used to date. In fact, later episodes kind of unpack the nature of her and Mr. Cream Puff's liaison. It seems he was created by the princess's uncle, Gumbold, with the intention that he should be her boyfriend, but even though he went through, you know, the motions of picking her up in his car and just generally being chivalrous, there was never really a spark or any romantic involvement. Bubblegum referred to him as like a boyfriend, but not actually a boyfriend, because dating someone does not make them your boyfriend. Similarly, she shows plenty of care and affection for Finn, and it's clear that their relationship is a close one. And even though Finn may have romantic feelings towards her, these are truly never reciprocated. All of that stands in sharp contrast to Princess Bubblegum's relationship with the vampire queen, Marceline. I ship this so much. Marceline is a fun-loving vampire musician, first introduced in series one as a classic goth-like classic goth vampire. She seems about as different from the pink-haired candy princess as it possible to be, but the relationship between the two women is explored in the series three episode, What Was Missing, revealing how the two have confused, conflicting feelings for one another, hinting at a backstory and the cherishing of one another. A promotional video series that recapped each episode ended up hinting a little more heavily at Bubblegum and Marceline's romantic relationship. <gasps> but that step forward for gay representation was very quickly followed by two, two steps back. Because not long after being published on YouTube, the promotional video recap was then taken down and the whole promo series was cancelled. Suspicious. The creators issued an apology for expanding a subtext too far Hmm? and implying that fan speculation had become part of the main plot. It is not clear how much controversy these hints of lesbianism had actually caused, but it sounds like the writers were just kind of getting cold feet about going down the lesbian route without realizing that it's what the audience wanted. Me. And indeed, Bubblegum and Marceline's relationship wasn't even mentioned for another two whole seasons. I'm too invested. However, by season five, it seemed that the creators finally felt able to follow through on the hints they had made two years before. Several episodes in that season revisited the idea of their closeness, hinting at shared history and treasured objects, and then depicting her physical closeness and intimacy, as well as allowing both characters to vocalize their care and love for one another. Their relationship stayed on the low boil for the next four years and five seasons, but the overall series finale finally gave what the LGBTQ Ross fans have been shipping all along. Princess Bubblegum and Marceline confess their true feelings for one another, and in a final montage, we get to see them enjoying life as a couple. So, after a somewhat uncertain start, at least as far as the creator's intentions were concerned, Adventure Time gives us the kind of representation that champions unconventional relationships, even among a world populated by candy people and vampires. However, where Adventure Time's lesbian narrative may have been confounded by the creator's cold feet, other kids' TV series have forged a more straightforward path to representation. Like the Disney show The Owl House, which began in 2020 and follows a human girl who finds a portal to the demon realm, as you do, and uses it to pursue her dreams of becoming a witch. 
In the demon realm, the 14-year-old human, Luz, attends Hexside School and develops friendships and attractions with a wide range of fantastical powered people. As you do. The normal, you know, changing schools drama. Among them is a girl called Amity Blight, who starts out as a friend, but is soon revealed to be something more. In a season one episode, it's revealed that Amity hoped to ask Luz to the Grom, which is Hexide's version of prom, before supernatural events took matters out of her hands. I get so invested in these things. Their relationship continued to develop, and by season two, Amity and Luz shared their first kiss. This is a much more straightforward approach to a gay relationship in a classic kind of coming of age teen cartoon that stems from the clear intentions of the series writer Dana Terrace. She identifies as bisexual and has been quite explicit in her desire to write a bi character into her animated work. And although she mentioned that the idea originally met with resistance from Disney, the LGBTQ themes in the Owl House are now fully supported. But perhaps no children's TV explores the variety of interpersonal relationships as well as the Cartoon Network series Steven Universe did. Over five seasons, from 2013 to 2019, we follow a boy called Steven Universe who lives with a group of mineral-based aliens called the Crystal Gems, as you do. The stories focus on Steven's adventures in saving the world from other gem-like aliens, but the show has always been quite upfront about exploring themes of love, family and relationships in all of their forms. Like Dana Terrace's clear motivation for her bi characters in the Owl House, Steven Universe's creator Rebecca Sugar also takes inspiration from her own bisexuality and feminism. In particular, the Crystal Gems have the unique approach to exploring interpersonal relationships and consent through the show's concept of fusion. In this, two or more gems can come together to make another unique gem that is the combination of the originals. But this fusion only works as long as there's some kind of emotional connection between the gems, be it platonic or romantic. This gives rise to a few interesting and kind of complex relationship dynamics. So for instance, two of Stephen's close gem friends, Ruby and Sapphire, both of whom are portrayed as feminine forms, explore their relationship with one another across several season 5 episodes, ultimately culminating in a marriage proposal, a lesbian wedding, and an uncensored lip-to-lip -lip kiss. What's more, the cool and kind of powerful Garnet, who acts as Stephen's guardian throughout the series, is a product of Ruby and Sapphire's fusion. But this fusion was described as forbidden, causing the pair to be sentenced to a shattering a fate from which they narrowly escaped. In this, the show is depicting how queer relationships often challenge the social norms and are not always fully embraced or understood, but are nevertheless championed in the context of Ruby and Sapphire's love. And that's not the only queer theme within the Steven Universe universe. We also see a romantic fusion between two feminine gems, Rose Quartz and Pearl, leading to a love triangle with Rose Quartz's human lover, Greg. Of course, there's a man called Greg. And in one episode, Stephen himself fuses with his human friend Connie, creating a new individual called Stevani, who identifies as gender neutral with they them pronouns. The show even confronts toxic gay relationships through non consensual fusing, as well as concepts of polyamory within the fusings of the Crystal Gems. It's really refreshing to just see how the imaginative fantasy world created for a children's imagination can be crafted to teach concepts such as inclusivity and consent to children at just all kinds of love. Hopefully we see more of it in children's TV in the years to come. Film. But while TV may have made great strides towards LGBTQ plus representation, the feature film world still seems to be finding its feet. And a lot of that has to do with the bigger audiences and the bigger controversy that they inevitably attract. Plus, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> China and Russia and the Middle East and Turkey and Pakistan, uh, you know, like, West Africa, Malaysia, Bangladesh, and a lot of other countries that I can't remember, you know, the places, um, you know, it's actually illegal to be gay in like 72 countries, so ban us at the cinema, ban us at the stake. And maybe, maybe a bit far on that last one. So, just like in the TV world, modern films have dipped their toes into the world of queer representation, with varying levels of commitment to success. Like in the 2017 live action remake of Beauty and the Beast, and the pompous Gaston is shadowed by a devoted and quite clearly camp sidekick Le Fou, this slapstick individual is sexually confused, wavering between wanting to be Gaston and wanting to kiss Gaston. Personally, still baffled as to why anyone would want to do either. And while it, you know, it was refreshing to see a new take on the very straight laced uh, Disney classic. 
Uh, Lefou's goofy campness didn't exactly send a, a modern accepting message about what it means to be gay. Did you know that gay people come in every flavour? Yeah, you can really taste the rainbow. He was just simply used for comic relief, with the concern that his sexuality was itself the, the comic relief. Other original films have attempted to make subtle nods to LGBTQ plus relationships, like the 2020 supernatural Disney movie Onward. In it, two elven brothers who are on a quest to bring their father back from the dead for a day. But in their adventure, they encounter a female Cyclops police officer who makes a reference to her girlfriend almost in passing, and the in passing bit is seemingly what makes it the most passable. Interestingly, the character is also played by an openly lesbian actress, Lena Wraith, who is said to have improvised the lines about Spectre's girlfriend. Despite this really quite minimal and unobtrusive mention, Onward ended up being banned in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman and Qatar, and edited before release in other Arab nations and Russia, so that Spectre mentions her sister or partner instead. So much for championing Pixar's first LGBTQ plus character. And the controversy doesn't end there. In 2022, Disney released Lightyear, the story of the Buzz Lightyear character that inspired the creation of the toy that co-stars in the Toy Story film. Now, Toy Story 4 had featured some background lesbians back in 2019 as two mums dropping off their child at kindergarten. I mean, it was a blink and you'll miss it scene, but it was noticed and celebrated by many in the queer community because you know. Oh, we will grab at any representation we can. However, when it came to extending that representation in Lightyear, uh, things didn't go so smoothly. The film features the space ranger Buzz Lightyear stranded on an alien planet with the crew of an exploration vessel testing new hyperspace fuel crystals they need to return home. His adventures see him jump forward in time and battle robots with a motley crew to keep the colony safe. Woo! Fun child stuff. But along the way we meet his best friend and commanding officer Alicia Hawthorne. With Buzz leaping forward several years with each test flight he completes, we see major milestones in Hawthorne's life flash by before Buzz's eyes, as well as our own. And among these milestones is her engagement, marriage, and starting a family with another female character, Kiko. Most controversially, it also features a same-sex kiss between the women. Is it controversial? No. Is it a same-sex kiss or is it just a kiss? Answers on the back of an envelope, please. Clearly, I mean, I say controversially, not because a kiss between two consenting women in a stable relationship is in itself anything to shy away from, but you know, because it caused quite the uproar on Facebook among audiences, Disney decision makers, and just people who have too much time on their hands and like to have their opinions heard because they have nothing better to do than write long rants online. Oh honey, get a life, your kid is fine, no one's being mentally scarred, ugh. The kiss was originally written into the film, but Disney officials then planned to cut it for reasons. But the editing of the film happened to coincide with a very inflammatory policy being signed into law in the state of Florida, informally called the Don't Say Gay Bill. This legislation made it illegal for schools to teach or even discuss sexual orientation and gender issues with their students. Oh yeah, which I'm sure you can imagine isn't in any way a horrific thing to say to the face of a five-year-old child who is just telling you about their mummy and mama. Your family's wrong, don't talk about it. Or a young teen who's telling you that they're about to be kicked out of their home because they don't identify as the sex they were assigned at birth. You don't matter, don't talk about it. You absolutely do matter. You are wonderful. You do belong. The horrors and injustices of American politics aside, this caused extra controversy amongst Disney's ranks since the company is the single biggest employer in the state of Florida and they seem to be doing nothing to push back at this ridiculous impingement on queer rights. In fact, it's even rumoured that other Disney films around the time, including Luca and Turning Red, had originally featured gay characters or scenes, but they had been cut again for reasons. The fact that Disney seemed to be meekly succumbing to the don't say gay bill caused so much outrage that the kiss scene was put back into the Lightyear film. And then this led to widespread banning of the movie across the Muslim world, including in Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, Malaysia, and many others, ultimately costing Disney millions of dollars in lost revenue. But go Disney, you did the right thing. I mean, it took you some time. Yeah, but you got there. Mm. 
And it's not going to be the only time LGBTQ plus representation has led to a rocky reception for a Disney new release. Starting with the late 2022 release, Strange World, Disney seems to have finally put to bed its reasons for quashing queer representation, and we are treated to the first real storyline featuring a gay character that's actually, you know, integral to the plot. In the movie, we follow the exploits of an explorer come farming family as they try to save their community from a mysterious plague affecting the crops that give them power. In a refreshing exploration of masculine relationships, we follow along with Ethan, a biracial gay teen, as he navigates normal teen angst, including his worries about not fulfilling his dad's expectations and a cringing crush on another young man, Diazzo. Even though Ethan's crush on Diazzo is a side plot, it isn't something that any of the writing shies away from. He discusses it openly and without shame or stigma with his entire family. The whole colourful film has a strong underlying moral worthiness to it without being heavy handed or overly preachy, so yay! The film had a poor reception on its opening weekend, however, it is overall projected to cost the studio up to 150 million. I am not going to blame the gay for this one though because I barely knew this film was coming out and I am fully gay. I mean genuinely, I only knew it was coming out because I saw the poster for it in the Disney HQ in London when I went to give a speech. That is ridiculous. Where was the promo? Now, while this may be due in part to dwindling numbers of theatergoers and competition from other film releases, there are some who suggest that Disney just intentionally held back on marketing and promoting this film due to this strong gay plotline. Anecdotally, there were few trailers for this film in cinemas and little in the way of social media marketing. So while Disney may have got over its cold feet in terms of writing gay characters, they not yet have the courage to actually promote them. Dumbledore. Oh, he got his own little title card. Yay, yikes. Oy. Moving away from Disney's internal dilemmas for a while, I feel like we can't possibly talk about gay representation in children's media without making mention of one of the most, you know, controversial queer icons of all time, Albus Dumbledore. A queer icon. Are we stretching that phrase? Oh, Albus, you've been done dirty. J.K. Rowling introduced the wizarding world of Harry Potter to young audiences back in 1997 with the publication of her first book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. At least that, you know, that's what it was called in the UK because uh, apparently you don't have philosophers in the US. You have sorcerers. More exciting. What followed over the next decade was a wildly successful seven book series that followed the magical adventures of Harry, Ron and Hermione at Hogwarts School alongside a colourful cast of teachers, parents, classical baddies and fantastical creatures all set in an immersive and believable magical world. So it's little wonder that the book sparked a similarly successful film series, theatre shows, video game franchises, spin-off books. I basically have to have been laying under a rock to have not heard of Harry Potter franchise. It's very nice for you, but I've got some bad news. So, when J.K. Rowling announced at an event in 2007 that she'd always thought of Hogwarts headmaster Albus Dumbledore as gay, it sent some serious ripples through the LGBTQ world and beyond. Many immediately saw it as a huge triumph for gay representation to have such a prominent gay character in one of the most well-known and influential children's series of all time. Audiences could look at the cool-headed but enigmatic Dumbledore as a gay role model whose personality was never really defined by his sexuality, but um, this raised issues for the extent and intention of the representation. If Dumbledore was gay, why had JK not said something sooner? Why did she never write any suggestion or hint of it into any of the million plus words of the canonical series? And why did it continue to not feature in any of the movie adaptations that followed? What are LGBTQ plus audiences supposed to think? Following the conclusion of the main film series, the Fantastic Beasts spin-off series of films provided something of a prequel to the main Harry Potter story, set in the same universe and featuring a much younger Albus Dumbledore, played by Jude Law. Uh-huh. Ooh, uh. Many saw this as the ideal opportunity for the franchise to finally acknowledge Dumbledore's sexuality, and there were high hopes for finally seeing some queer representation in the magical world. Yeah? But as first one and then another of the Fantastical Beasts films were released, featuring no such representation, viewers were left dismayed and disappointed. It was only in the last film, aptly titled The Secrets of Dumbledore, released in 2022, that audiences were finally granted an on-screen mention of what J.K. Rowling had been hinting at for 15 years. While talking about mistakes he made during his youth, he says directly it was because he was in love with the dark 
wizard Grindelwald. He says it directly to Grindelwald's face and also to other characters, alluding to an intense romantic relationship when the two were teenagers. Because obviously you have to fall in love with the bad one. It was a long-awaited triumphal moment for gay representation, but was it too little too late? In contrast to Disney's accepting the financial losses from their pro-LGBTQ plus movies being banned in certain countries, Warner Brothers chose instead just, you know, cut specific lines from The Secrets of Dumbledore, allowing the film to be distributed to all markets worldwide. Hmm. Which, you know, leaves a bad taste for multiple reasons, not least of which is that, and again, person who lived under the rock, this is going to come as a surprise to you. In the last few years, J.K. Rowling herself has attracted a lot of bad press and uh, controversy following her outspoken views on the rights of transgender people. Hmm. <coughs> hmm. Which is a video in itself. See, all of these. She's become a polarising figure in the LGBTQ plus community and her long history of talking about, but for never truly fully implementing Dumbledore's sexuality in the Wizarding World canon doesn't exactly help her case. Not out characters. So far, I've been talking specifically about characters within children's media that are explicitly out. They've been given storylines or dialogue that express their sexuality either individually or via a relationship, or the authors have just kind of made it clear that that's their intention. And as the release dates of all these TV shows and movies have shown, this overt representation really is a new phenomenon. But there is still solace for the LGBTQ plus community to be found in children's shows today and as far back as my childhood days in the form of characters that aren't out, but nevertheless just scream queer at us. Headcanon, our own happy places. I've talked about this phenomenon in general in my previous video on queer goading, but essentially you can kind of think of it as when a character is presented as queer, um, without showing they are, saying they are, or just ever being referenced to as such, but like, you know, we get it, we know it, we feel it, and now when you're older and talking to your queer friends about that show, it just so happens they have the same favourite character too, because there was a vibe. And there are themes, the effeminate man who wears a waistcoat and solves tricky puzzles, or the woman in a white vest top who hits stuff. But naturally, it's a much more subjective distinction, as what shouts queer for one person may not be the same as for another. And children's media is not immune from such subtextual speculation. Take, for example, Debbie Thornbury, the side part rocking, baggy jeans wearing, 16 year old daughter in the Wild Thornberries, an animated series that aired on Nickelodeon between 1998 and 2004. Debbie is giving us the ultimate queer hipster vibes in a checkered flannel as she accompanies her nature documentary making parents and wilder younger siblings around the world. She is giving you epic friends older sister you hope to god would give you a passing glance and never get a boyfriend but probably isn't even vaguely aware you exist vibes. Yeah, she has a special best friend. Or how about Francine Frensky from the long-running PBS series Arthur? The anthropomorphic monkey stands in contrast to other female characters, preferring jeans and jumpers over dresses and braids, friends she really likes. Not only that, but she takes queer boxes by being athletic and actively disinterested in boys, while her schoolmates are developing hetero relationships. And hello, Francine's haircut in the finale flash forward. We do indeed see you. Then, Ashley Splinelli from the 1997 to 2001 Disney series Recess. Trademark beanie, bunches. She's the ultimate tomboy, embracing her own rebelliousness and love of wrestling. Or perhaps Reggie Rocket, the only girl in Team Rocket of the Nickelodeon series, Rocket Power. She's a tomboy too, epitomizing everything it means to be a badass skateboarder girl. Do I have a type? Although let's be clear, being a tomboy does not mean you're automatically going to grow up to be any part of the LGBTQ plus community. Sometimes queer coding also comes in the form of certain same-sex friendships coming tantalizing and close to suggesting something more, but never truly crossing the ocean, separating subtext from canon. Like the intense friendship between Pocahontas and her best friend Nakoma in the 1995 animated film Pocahontas. I mean, even the title character's eventual kiss with John Smith, it just does, it's just little to quench the romantic tension between the two young women, especially during a certain steamy waterfall scene. Just kiss her! 
or the physical clash between Kim Possible and her arch nemesis Shigo in the Disney series named after the crime fighting main character. Again, mm, oh I fully ship this one. Photographic evidence here. I mean, it's, it's clearly, 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 clearly the two of them are. Also, Shigo got her powers from being struck, struck by a rainbow comet. The subject is clear. Now, all of these are shows that date back to my childhood, um, for obvious reasons. But I'm sure there are plenty more examples from your own childhood <laughs> that can be found across British and American kids shows and others. But there are also instances of queer coding in more modern creations too, alongside the more overtly out characters, like in the 2021 101 Dalmatians live-action spin-off Cruella. In the film, the character Artie is the flamboyant owner of a vintage fashion store frequented by the title character and helps to design a clothing line. The character is played by openly gay actor John McCrea, who undoubtedly played him as queer, even though Artie was never explicitly written as such. I mean, in my opinion, the film's all the better for it, but can we say this is a queer character? Hmm. Well, why is the assumption, if we don't find out about someone's romantic life, that, oh, default to straightness? So, whether on TV, film, or in writing, out or not out, obvious or covert, there is really no shortage of LGBTQ plus representation to be found within children's media nowadays. Some creators are retrofitting their characters to acknowledge queer diversity. For instance, the Scooby-Doo writers have recently confirmed that the glasses wearing Bob Rocking Velma is a lesbian. We knew, Velma. We knew, hon. And Nickelodeon capitalised on Pride Month in 2020 by announcing that SpongeBob SquarePants is gay as well. Okay. I did not see that one coming. As to whether these will ever amount to more than the uh, lowest stakes mention in order to capitalise on a marginalised audience remains to be seen. But if the trend set by Adventure Time and Owl House and Strange World continues, we can expect to see a lot more representation in new creations in the future, even if the subject remains a, a sticky one for some countries and Florida. If you'd like to hear more about being gay and raising a child in the modern world, you can also follow me on TikTok at Jessica Out of the Closet and Instagram at Jessica Out of the Closet or at Jessie and Claude with my wife. And you can also help support all this wonderful LGBTQ plus content and help me pay off my student loans by heading over and buying some of the beautiful Jessica Out of the Closet merchandise like these adorable patches with Walter and Tilly's faces on them. Delightful. Links to those can be found down in the description. They are currently 30% off. If you would like to watch more media analysis videos, then I have a whole playlist of them. And there's a nifty little link up here. Again, also in the description. In the past, I've covered general subjects like autism and queer coding in the media, plus more specific topics like lesbian vampires. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I shall see you next time. Mwah.